She is, of course, the incredibly witty, capitalised Lee Sales of Twitter fame, who um, was quite pioneering in, in her invention of a, a unique technique for tweeting <laughs> as a journalist. Um, Lee Sales uh, is, a, is a journalist and author who anchors um, the acclaimed Late Line program on ABC One. From 2001 to 2005, she was the ABC's Washington correspondent, and from 2006 to 2007, the network's national security correspondent. She won a Walkley Award in 2005 for her coverage of Guantanamo Bay and was also nominated in 2006 for her on-the-ground reporting of Hurricane Katrina. Lee's first book, Detainee 002, The Case of David Hicks, won the George Munster Prize for Independent Journalism and was a finalist in the Victorian Premier's Literary Awards. Her second book, On Doubt, was part of Melbourne University publishing series Little Books on Big Ideas. Lee writes a formerly, a fortnightly rather, blog called Well Redhead, Baboom Tish, <laughs> for the ABC and for News Limited. Her writing also appears regularly in the monthly. Sitting next to Lee is Professor Catherine Lumby. She is the director of the Journalism and Media Research um, Centre at the University of New South Wales. She was formerly the chair of the Media and Communications Department at the University of Sydney. Professor Lumby is the author of seven books and numerous book chapters and journal articles. She's been a news reporter, feature writer and columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Bulletin magazine. Sitting next to Catherine is Chris Warren. Christopher Warren is the Federal Secretary of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance, who have really gotten on board with this project um, and see the need that we're all struggling with to try to resolve some of these issues. He's the CEO of the Walkley Foundation for Excellence in Journalism. He was president of the International Federation of Journalists from 1998 to 2007. He started in journalism at the Sydney Morning Herald um, in 1976, and he's worked for the ABC as well as being a lecturer in journalism at the University of Technology in Sydney. Then we have John Bergen, who is the digital channel manager at Sky News, where he's responsible for editorial control across Sky News and Sky News Active. He studied English and political science at the University of New South Wales and also holds qualifications in advertising and marketing. When he's not working, reading, writing or tweeting, he sleeps. And last but not least, we have Kate Crawford. Um, Associate Professor Kate Crawford is based in the Journalism and Media Research Centre with Catherine Lumby. Um, her research focuses on social change and media technologies, particularly uh, the internet and mobile media. She currently holds an ARC Discovery Postdoctoral Fellowship to conduct a major three-year study with Jared Goggin into mobile media use, focusing on questions of effect, youth culture and sociality. And so I'm going to ask Lee to come to the podium. Thanks. Thank you and hello everyone. Um, I can't help but fear that those of you uh, who follow me on Twitter um, are going to be let down unless I deliver my entire address in cringeworthy puns. Uh, but in order to spare us all that pain, I'm going to play it pretty straight. So I can see you all now already twittering, ooh, hashtag sales fails. <laughs> yes, you laugh because you know it's true. <laughs> Um, I didn't see all of Mark Scott's uh, address this morning, but I'm told that he said that my puns are the worst known to mankind, um, to which I immediately tweeted, you won't get away with that, Scott Free, mark my words. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, just so we're all on the same page about the punning, um, they're not funny. They're deliberately not funny. That's why they're funny. Although some of them are also legitimately funny. <laughs> Anyway, when I was asked to summarise my address today in 140 characters or less, it was very easy and it required a lot fewer characters, in fact. My guide to ethics and professionalism for journalists in the social media age can be explained as, if in doubt, leave it out. In other words, with what I put on Twitter, as with what I write and broadcast generally, I err on the side of caution. I aim to protect my journalistic reputation, but I do hope that with my Twitter stream um, it brings an extra dimension because there's a sort of light-hearted um, aspect uh, to what I put up there that doesn't appear very often in the sort of work I do um, elsewhere in journalism. Let me back up first. Before I go into the ethical and professional considerations, it might be useful to explain why I tweet. There are four key reasons. Not to be left out, because media technology is changing so rapidly, I'd rather give something a go and then drop it when the next thing comes along than not be a part of it at all. And I do think that journalists who don't adopt that mindset are fast becoming dinosaurs. 
To gather information, I constantly refine the stream of people that I follow so that I'm getting information that's useful to me, so I add people and drop people all the time. To diversify my brand, if you like, and to attract new people to my writing and my broadcasting, and for product promotion to spruik what's coming up on Late Line and so on. I realised fairly quickly on Twitter that the type of uh, tweeters that I follow um, sort of fall into two groups. There are the really useful ones. For example, the Times of London I really like because it posts very sharp, short, pithy links um, to lots of excellent content. Or I also follow ones that are entertaining. So there's one I really like called "At Shit My Dad Says" um, by somebody <laughs> called Justin, whose blurb reads, "I'm 29. I live with my 73-year-old dad. He's awesome. I just write down shit that he says, <laughs> <laughs> and it is absolutely hilarious." In terms of my own stream, my goal was to provide content that would be both useful and entertaining, so that people、um, who came to follow me would, over time, a trust that my own journalistic product that I was linking to was going to be interesting and relevant and, and useful and worth reading,、um, and b that things that I linked to would similarly、um, display those qualities.、Um, And I also wanted people to enjoy my company. That if they saw something from me on Twitter that wasn't necessarily useful, that it might just make them laugh and might just make them feel a little bit better. I read recently a comment by somebody who said that to be a success on Twitter, you have to be the friend that everyone wants to hang out with, and that's very much the sort of persona that I've tried to、um, adopt. I've wanted to have a credible brand, but also, I guess, one that's warm and friendly too. So the trickiest thing for me in、um, building this Twitter feed was the idea that I wanted to make it entertaining. The second part of what I was hoping to do, because my public persona is not one that's particularly funny or entertaining. I'm about as far down the pointy-headed end of the journalistic spectrum as you can get. I'm a former Washington correspondent, a former national security correspondent. My last book muses on the value of doubt as an intellectual premise. The one before that was about the merits of U.S. detainee policy in the war on terror. Quite frankly, let's face it, I sound on paper like the sort of person who could bore for Australia. <laughs> But I'd like to think that in real life, I don't take myself quite that seriously. So, in starting my Twitter stream, and coincidentally, the Well Redhead blog started just a little bit after that. I wanted to attract people to the serious work I do and to serious journalism by having them think, "Oh, well, she seems pretty nice. She seems pretty fun. She's interested in serious stuff like the Iran election or national security or whatever." Hopefully, she can tell us about it in a way that is informative, but also interesting and entertaining. I did feel, though, at the same time, that I was taking a bit of a risk because, in trying to diversify my brand、um, so that it wasn't all really serious,、um, I didn't want to undermine the journalistic credibility that I'd built up over the years. And to me, those two things are not incompatible. As a serious journalist, really, there should be no reason that I can't show that I have a lighter side to my personality and reveal that yes, I do have a sense of humour. But I wasn't persuaded that some of the more doer critics of the ABC would share that view, and I could imagine the, you know, well, what a waste of our taxpayer dollars to have the anchor of a sophisticated program like Late Line tweeting things like study shows parrots like heavy metal music. Polly want a lip, limp biscuit.、Um, So that brings me to the how of my tweeting and how I tried to marry these two、um, things that I worried some people might see as contradictory: serious journalism and a little bit of humour, and how that fits、um, with ethics and professionalism around this medium. As I said earlier, right from the first day, my chief principle was: if in doubt, leave it out. If I think of something that I want to write on Twitter and it gives me pause, I won't put it up, even if I think maybe I'm overreacting and be a little bit cautious. That's the general rule of thumb for myself. If I think,、oh, I hope that's not offensive, it just doesn't go up.、Um, that doesn't mean I always get it right, of course.、Um, I'm also a little careful for the same reason about things that I retweet because I think that a retweet can sometimes be viewed as a sign that you're endorsing the content that you're retweeting. So, for example, somebody recently sent me 
this priceless article from the Northern Territory News with these hilarious and very ribald comments from a woman who was interviewed in it. And even though I just absolutely loved it and thought it was so funny, and I'm sure that my followers would have also loved it, I just felt that it wasn't appropriate for me um, to retweet. Maybe it was perfectly fine, but because my rule is to err on the side of caution, that's what I did. And, you know, what I choose to not tweet about might be perfectly all right for somebody else. Julian Morrow could tweet on it. Annabelle Crabb could tweet on it. But I do feel that because of my position at Late Line that I do have to be a little bit uh, cautious, even though, as I said, I try to be lighthearted too. The idea to hold back if in doubt applies to me both in matters of accuracy and taste. In terms of accuracy, I treat it exactly like I treat any of my journalistic reporting. I will always tweet the source of a story. So, for example, if ABC News is reporting that um, an earthquake has hit Samoa, I will say ABC News is reporting it. Or if the New York Times is reporting that Obama's won the Nobel Peace Prize, I will um, source that. If it's something that is from a primary source of my own, like Chris Yulman, I'm trying to get it verified as well. So, for example, on the night of the... Um, Liberal Party pre-selection in Bradfield, I got a text message from somebody who was at the pre-selection and then within 10 minutes another text message from a coalition frontbencher and they were both sources that I had trusted and had dealt with and so their information was reliable so I was quite happy to then put that information out into the public domain. So for me there's no difference really with that approach to how I approach it if I was reporting for radio news or, or anything. On taste, my general rule is that I don't make jokes or puns about stories that I might have to cover on late line. So I rarely touch anything to do with federal politics, even though God knows there's a lot of jokes to be had there, as Annabelle Crabb can attest. I'm not saying that I always get this right on the matters of taste. There's one example that springs to mind where I think I might have mucked up, which was, um, so I'll publicise it now for any of you who didn't see it, um, <laughs> It was when the actress who played Mrs. Slocum on Are You Being Served died, and I tweeted something like, Mrs. Slocum has passed away. I hear she's being buried with her pussy. <laughs> now, anybody who's familiar, and maybe this audience is a little young, anybody who's familiar with Are You Being Served gets the pussy gag. And I was attempting to play on the humour of the show, not to make any sort of blue gag, and I didn't even really hit think before I hit send. I didn't even really have a moment's pause. I just assumed anyone who read that would get that the gag was on Are You Being Served. Um, but after I tweeted it, I did think probably should have come under the uh, rule, if in doubt, leave it out. Because, again, it was the sort of thing that I could imagine a critic of the ABC saying, oh, is this the sort of filth we taxpayers are paying for, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I also thought, you know, well, somebody did actually die. So it maybe wasn't a good thing to make a joke about. So for, you know, for the 95% of people who read it and just thought it was mildly amusing or not, um, there were probably other people who found it offensive and so I just think that that's an example where um, my filter probably didn't operate as well as it should have and uh, you know it's a sort of gag I think there are some gags that you share at the breakfast table with your husband and there are some gags that you put online and, and uh, you have to be careful that you know the difference. I guess one thing that should be fairly apparent from what I'm saying is that the at Lee Sales persona that you may or may not follow on Twitter is not fully me, because I would share that Mrs. Slocum gag, no worries, at lunch with some friends and many other uh, risque gags too, but um, I wouldn't put them out into the public domain. So I'm hoping that on Twitter I'm giving... Um, that I am more personable and approachable than I am in, say, a medium like Late Line, but you can see that it's still not exactly who I am. You're seeing my, more of my personality, and certainly what I put on Twitter is not false or fake or manufactured. I'm not making up some persona, but it still is reasonably carefully constructed too. So I think in summary that from this ethical professional perspective, I treat my public utterances on Twitter very much like I treat any public appearance that I might, might make. It is a different medium to any of the standard news and current affairs mediums in which I've appeared because there is more, more, more personality involved. I think it's probably closer to if you're anchoring something like Drive on radio where you are moving from serious content to sometimes quite light-hearted content um, and the audience is prepared to go with you based on, on wherever you take them. I don't suggest that I'm doing, the, doing it the right way. I don't suggest that everyone should do it my way. Um, that's just the way that I'm doing it and I'm learning as I go. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, this is my dog. His name is Scruff. This is my family. And in particular, I'd like you to pay attention to Charlie and Sam, the apparently well-behaved children in that photograph. And this is a silly hat. And to be specific, this is the kind of silly hat that they give you as a reward for completing a PhD. <clears throat> I'm still waiting for the Maserati. Uh, I have one of these silly hats at home, and the other day I was looking for my silly hat because, as it happened, I had to give a graduation address that night. Um, and I'm searching around, and I found the silly hat with my children and the dog. Um, and I asked them what they were doing because they were putting the silly hat on the dog and videoing the dog. I said, why are you doing that? They had my mobile phone too, which didn't please me. Um, and they explained that they were making a video to put on YouTube and that the video was called Professor Blah Blah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know where this is going, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Now, it's a pretty simple idea, really. Put the hat on the dog and encourage him to bark at random objects. <laughs> it's meant to be like you on TV, Mum, my seven-year-old explained helpfully. Now, I don't think that that's a family anecdote. That story, I think, um, is a bit of a parable for the age we're in, um, and it doesn't really need a lot of glossing for this audience. Um, I mean, clearly, even very young children, and some of you will have them or be in contact with them, you'll know that they are not only manipulating digital technology with extraordinary confidence, but what goes with that, I think, is an increasing scepticism about uh, the sort of slew of experts that we still see pronouncing on things uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, and my children engage me in questions all the time about why is it that some people seem to get an extraordinary amount of mainstream media airtime uh, and other people don't. You know, what's the gatekeeping process? How do you, how do you get on TV or radio? Um, and, and I think, you know, it's interesting to see children even that young already being extremely sceptical about what I think of as the old top-down, trickle-down model of mainstream media expertise. <clears throat> now, very clearly, my children are part of an emergent generation of media consumers who take it as read that they are equally media producers. They're growing up in a world that is defined by online and digital media and by the level of user participation that we know characterises social networking sites and the whole post-Web2 environment. <clears throat> so they already have a radically different relationship, this is what I see on a daily basis, to their role as media consumers. They have completely different expectations. Um, and now I'm going to uh, reveal how old I am because I started working as a journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald in the mid-1980s um, and performed a whole range of roles there over the years. And one of the things I did for a while was I was the letters editor. And I was think reflecting on that before when I was preparing this brief talk for today and thinking, you know, it was really still an era where people felt privileged to get published on the letters page. You know, that was, people kept those pages and, and, you know, there were people who competed to get onto the letters page. Uh, it was also an era in which people took the op-ed page and the editorials seriously, you know. It was opinion-leading stuff. I don't know that the same can always be said today. <clears throat> now, that was an era, I think, in which journalistic professionalism and journalistic ethics were very much defined by journalists and media producers in what I think we might see now as a fairly paternalistic and top-down manner. The driving assumption was that journalists and editors were the gatekeepers of information for the public and that they were there to make decisions about what news was fit to, fit to print and what wasn't. Journalists in this sense operated as non-elected representatives of the public uh, and they worked collectively as the fourth estate, acting as watchdogs of the public and private sectors on behalf of their audiences. Now, I don't want to say there isn't still some very important and tradition, you know, terrific uh, top-level journalism going on in this country or that we do, you know, suddenly don't need journalists. But I think one of the things I want to say in my brief moment here today um, is that I do think we need to broaden our understanding of what we mean by media ethics and what, what, what happens to professionalism in, in an era when amateurs are very much involved increasingly in media production. <clears throat> Because I think that we need to start thinking about how we involve audiences in understanding and facilitating 
and ethics of engagement. And that's the, that's the sort of final point I'll put on this. Um, I think that, you know, talking to some journalists, and certainly not all, they have a sort of view um, that the great unwashed mass of media consumers are kind of barbarians. Um, that, you know, journalists are the professionals, these people are the, are the amateurs. Uh, but I think, you know, really the barbarians are not at the gates anymore. They're inside the castle and they're redecorating it in garish new colours. And we need to contend with that. And we need to contend with that when we think about what we think about as ethics and an ethics of engagement. And I think the, the example I'll give here is when you go to most mainstream news sites and you look at the comments that are logged after someone's posted. And I do a bit of writing for The Punch, so you know, I, I often go and look at what comments people have posted. And one of the things I think you find is that a lot of those comments are just rants and raves. There is very, very little considered dialogic engagement there. Um, and it, you know, the, the metaphor that comes to mind is you know, you're going out for a, a drink with a couple of friends and you want to have a good dialogue about something. You put your head around the door of a pub and there's a brawl going on. Well, you don't go in there and have a drink, do you? And I think that most reasonable people who go to those online sites take a look at the sort of vitriol and the ranting and raving and think, I'm out of here. So I think one of the things we need to think about is what kind of strategy might we have for engaging the audiences um, and, and, and the communities, if you like, who collect around mainstream news sites and, and places like The Punch uh, in something more than just a sort of comment function. Uh, and I think here of the work of Axel Bruns, um, who works up at QUT, who's done a lot of work about how meaningful communities are built on social networking sites. And one of the things he talks about is how the community eventually uh, sets its own tone. It becomes, if you like, self-regulating, if we're thinking about an ethics of engagement. Uh, and I think that you know, one of the ways you do that is by, by role modelling some of the sort of content that's produced, but also by giving those communities, the people who are being brought in to interact, a lot more engagement in how the site's built, in, in what the kinds of rules of engagement are. And I think that means really letting go of a very traditional era of media ethics in which journalists and media producers made decisions about where the ethical lines were and made them on behalf of consumers. I think that's where I'd like to end. I think we need to rethink that and start involving uh, media consumers in that. And I think that one of the people who did this very, very early um, and in a really landmark way was Margot Kingston with Deb Web Diary, in which very early on she identified active readers of the site. She invited them not just to post material, but actually to, to start becoming involved in producing content for the site. She uh, worked with them, she mentored them, um, and she invited her readers to draw up a code of ethics, and they did that in dialogue. Um, and that was 1999, and I think we could all learn a lot from what Margot did way back then. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Chris Warren, would you like to come up? Anyone who ever studied uh, economics at... Uh either school or university, would be familiar with the concept of Gresham's Law, that bad money dri drives out good. I'm a fundamental optimist on this issue, and I think when we come to information that actually the reverse is the, tr is the truth, that good information drives out bad, that people are much more, uh, much more media literate than we give them credit, credit for, and have always been so that people know when they're, what they're reading is rubbish, they know when what they're reading is politically slanted, and they know when what they're reading is good journalism. And that's why I think when we're starting to talk about ethics and quality in the, in the, modern, in the, the modern age, we need to continue to bear a light touch on these issues, that we shouldn't be excessively proscriptive either in a uh, regulatory way or indeed in a judgmental way because I think the fundamental principles that have underpinned an, uh, an ethical approach to journalism for the past century, which is really how long journalism as we know it has been around, uh, have remained as true in the new medium as they've ever been and they are respect for truth, respect for the public's right to know and respect for the rights of others. I do want to really uh, 
disagree, I think, with some of the comments that the, that the, that the previous speaker made, who kind of suggested that these ethics were somehow handed down in tablets of stone and by the wise elders of, of, uh, of, of, our, of our craft. In fact, the code of ethics, ethical journalism, has always been a fundamental terrain of struggle in journalism. The, the journalism code of ethics, the, what we now call our, the alliance code of ethics, which is now accepted as part of the landscape of Australian journalism, only became part of that landscape as a result of 20 years of profound struggle between working journalists and, the, and their employers. Uh, old Sir Frank Packer, in fact he wasn't even Sir Frank Packer there, took, uh, took us to the High Court to try to strike down the very concept of a journalist's code of ethics. So we need to remember that, that the concept of ethics is something that's grown out of a terrain of struggle partly between journalists and their, and their employers, but, but also more broadly between journalists and the community that journalists serve on the one hand and the uh, employers fundamentally, uh, corp commercial interests fundamentally uh, on the other. And that is something where nothing has changed uh, in that and we shouldn't uh, be confused by the bright lights of the new technology in thinking that, that, there's, that there is much that we're dealing with now that we haven't dealt with in the past. Now, what do I mean when I talk about respect for truth? Uh, and we've had a bit of a discussion today about some aspects about that. Before lunch, there was a bit of a discussion about whether ghost Twitterers are an acceptable or somehow is an untrue uh, personality. Uh, and I think that's an open question. I don't think anyone really, I don't think we really have an accepted uh, view about whether that's, uh, whether that's right or not. One of the mo most important areas of debate about about this, and a number of speakers have, talk, have drawn the parallel between Twitter and talkback radio, uh, is the role of commercialisation within social media and the use of social media to promote a commercial product. As many of you know, in the, uh, in the United States now, the uh, US uh, Federal Trade Commission has required that anyone writing online, whether a blogger, a commentator, a Twitterer, has to declare any commercial arrangement or make clear any, uh, any, personal arra any commercial arrangement they may have in place. And I think that's a way in which those traditional principles of respect for truth and the underpin things that underpin that truth are playing out in the new, in the new media. And it's, in, and it's that division between commerciality, what we would think of as journalistic notions of truth, uh, that form a kind of a Chinese wall that all journalists uh, carry around uh, inside, uh, inside their heads. The second uh, fundamental principle I talked about is respect for the public's right to know. And when we're talking about social media, of course, we need to think about what do we mean by the public? Because when we talk about respect for the public's right to know, that we come to the social aspect of, of social media. Respect for truth is fundamentally still, in many ways, a one-way uh, form of uh, ethic. But it's when we come to the respect for the public's right to know that we, that we build in the social aspect of social media because the public's right to know is, uh, I think, varies from public to public and varies from person to person. Their interest varies from person to person. Uh, I found uh, Annabel Crabbe's comments earlier uh, very apposite in this, that one of the great benefits of, uh, the, of Twittering is that people can select whether they want to know that or not. And that's, in fact, one of the important empowering aspects of, uh, of social media. And the third aspect is the respect for the public's, uh, respect for the rights of others. And can I say this is an issue that I think many in journalism are still struggling with. Uh, because one of the things that I think journalism is struggling with is what happens when you take social media out of context. I think there was a discussion early today about the use of Facebook photos in, in mainstream media. And I think there's a real live debate about whether that is ethically appropriate or not. On the one hand, you're dealing with photos that are, in the, uh, that are in the public domain. On the other, you're dealing with things that aren't really in the public domain or only in a particular aspect uh, of, the, of the public domain. So I think the respect, for the, for the respect for the right of others in a social media environment is, I think, an issue that journalists and the journalist community are still struggling to come to terms with. It's something we're still struggling to understand, still struggling to understand uh, what, uh, what is appropriate. Uh, I said at the beginning that I think people know rubbish when they see it, because I think this, the second aspect of 
uh, the principle that says good information drives out bad, is this, that as professional journalists, we have to be conscious of how tenuous public support for the brand of journalism is. As journalists, we kind of assume, well, I think all journalists start to assume, well, in fact, um, when I was a cadet journalist, we used to always think there are only two people in the world, journalists and people who want to be journalists. Uh, and I think in their heart, all journalists still think that's, uh, still think that's true. Uh, but tragically, it's not true. In fact, there are probably three, three types of people in the world, journalists, people who want to be journalists, and people who just hate every journalist they've ever heard in their life. And tragically, that third group is increasingly large. And it's when, it's when we push the boundaries, push the boundaries of quality, push the boundaries of ethics, we see it in the current debate about, uh, about, about privacy, we fundamentally are damaging the brand of journalism at a time when the brand of journalism is fundamentally under pressure, when the brand of journalism is not as popular and as accepted and as accepted for its professionalism and ethics uh, as, we would, uh, as we would like to believe it is. And that is fundamentally the challenge that we as journalists face in social media, is how do we ensure that our understanding of the ethical, uh, of the ethical propositions in, in, uh, in social media are, the, are broadly accepted by the community, uh, as the ethics that we developed for old media were broadly accepted by the uh, by the community, and how we ensure that in reaching that we don't do such irrevocable damage to the concept of journalists and journalism that the, uh, that the idea of professionalism and ethics will come to be seen as one of those quaint uh, 20th century notions. Thank you very much. Thank you,